in 2019, I sent an email to the people at UCLA and I wrote, in two months, I'm going to teach a quantum programming class. And within an hour, two professors wrote to me that they had changed their schedule so that they could attend my class. So no pressure, but the students were excited. And as of today, 200 students have taken my course and all of them have run programs on quantum computers. And um, as you can see on the next slide, I believe that we can give students quantum knowledge and skill and agency, and we can do it at scale. And I just want to tell you up front, the, the next slide gives my uh, teaching evaluations. I got some of the best teaching evaluations of my, of my career. And I know what you're thinking. What happened in 2021? And what happened this year was that we relaxed the requirement for how much linear algebra students had to know before they get into the class. And uh, it worked great. This, some of them struggled a little more, but they all loved it. And so today I want to talk about what did I do? And uh, I'm going to go into three points. First of all, I set up the class as a learning lab so that students could learn from each other. And second, I went for breadth so that there's something for everybody. And then third, I let them loose on two quantum computers, and then I asked them to write reports about it. And um, so let me, let me begin with what I think is, is one of the biggest problems of teaching a class at scale, which is the diverse group of students. And the next slide talks about my students. Uh, they're from computer science, that's most of them, but also from physics, chemistry, electrical engineering, mathematics, other departments. And it's a big mix of students that are master students, undergraduate students, PhD students. And how do, you, how do you teach such a diverse group of students anything? In particular, what can you rely on that they already know? And uh, I realized very quickly that they actually know a fair amount of linear algebra. And then I made an observation. Uh, so on the next slide, I have a picture of Jackie Dari's book, uh, which is a wonderful book about quantum computing. But when you get to the third part of the book, it has the mathematical toolkit. And so what I told my students ahead of the class was flip through the third part. Um, it's all the math that you need. Just check that you know it already. And if there's some of it that you don't know, then uh, just uh, read through it and you will be prepared. And so that way I didn't have to spend much time on going through linear algebra in the class and I could get to the quantum computing faster. So the second thing about diversity is if we take the union of, all, of what all these students know about quantum computing, it's probably more than what I know. And so we need to set things up so that they can learn not only from me, but they can also learn from each other. And so uh, we need to give these students a voice. And so as you can see on the next slide, I had three ways of doing that. So first of all, I, I made my lectures uh, into a place where they could ask lots of questions. Uh, in fact, I allocated lots of time, so the lectures almost became an ask me anything about quantum. Uh, sometimes I would answer the questions, sometimes other students would answer the questions. And overall, it became a way to connect, it became a way to talk together. And um, I also know that there are some students who who don't want to speak up in class. So we had a discussion website. We use Piazza and uh, I told them, I'm gonna grade you on your participation, ask questions, answer somebody else's questions, point to a, an article that you read or find a bug in the lecture notes, whatever it is, but contribute something. And so that way we, uh, we got a whole sort of quantum learning community going and, um, and a, lot of, a lot of interaction. And as these classes were moving forward, I got veteran students to help me uh, respond to all the comments online. And so that way everybody felt heard, everybody felt appreciated. And then the third thing is that uh, after about half the class, I divide the students into groups and uh, typically groups are free. And then I use a trick I learned in business school, which is to uh, give more work than any single student can reasonably do alone. And that way we force them to, to work together and to talk together about quantum. And so, so that's the setup with this diverse group of students. And so now how do we structure a course for such a diverse crowd? And so this is where I went for breadth. And as, as you can see on the next slide, it really, I have 10 weeks. I have 11 weeks, 10 weeks of lectures, 11 weeks, because there's also a final exam week that I grab for projects. And, um, and so it's a, it's a big opportunity to teach some knowledge and skills of quantum. And, and I found out that what I really want to do is to both teach an algorithms course and a languages course and an implementation course at the same time. 
And um, so, of course, I want to uh, show some different quantum algorithms so we can see what quantum can do. I, I want to show some different languages so people can see what the, what the language designers are thinking about, knowing that the best quantum language probably has not been invented yet. And then I'm a compiler guy by training. And so, of course, I want to talk about implementation. And, and so now the question is, how much background do we need before we can start to talk about all this? And what I found was not very much. And so actually my uh, course schedule is on the next slide and you will see two weeks. Two weeks is all I have. And so with two weeks, well, the first lecture I go into what is a qubit and uh, where do all these complex numbers come from? So I talk about the double slit experiment. And then second lecture is the interface to quantum mechanics. So I talk about the four postulates. And I also talk about the upgrade path from uh, classical computing to probabilistic computing to quantum computing. And then the third lecture is the one lecture where I say, okay, linear algebra, unitary matrices, tensor products, Dirac notation, and uh, sort of just, just get that all down so that we all on the same page. And then, and then in the fourth lecture, I can start to talk about quantum circuits. So we do teleportation, super dense coding. I get to, to show the no cloning theorem. And I also get a chance to talk about uh, universal sets of gates so that they're really prepared for quantum computers. And then we are ready for algorithms. And I, uh, I first I cover uh, what I think Jackie Dowry calls the canon, Deutsch Joseph, Bernstein Maserani, Simon's algorithm, Grover's algorithm. I go through complete proofs of these algorithms. I show examples of how they run. Uh, in some cases, I show on my computer how they run with a simulator. And um, and then we uh, later get into QIOA and we get, get into Shaw's algorithm and again with examples and all this. And, uh, and what I found is that, that it's very good to have different ways of latching onto the material. The theoretically inclined students love the proofs, the more experimentally inclined students love the experiments and they all love the examples. And so there's just something uh, everybody can relate to. So once we're done with the algorithms, we get to the languages. And so there I uh, cover two languages. So I cover CERC from Google. Uh, I uh, actually use the Colab that I saw uh, at the CERC bootcamp a couple of years ago. That's a very good one. And, um, and I use Qiskit from IBM. And um, for that, we use our own material. And uh, really all of this is about what does a program look like? Uh, what uh, what does, does it take to get these things to run? And particularly, how, what does it take to get a simulator for these languages to run on, on your own laptop. And then I have five lectures on implementation. And um, so uh, uh, I just squeezed in as many lectures as I could as a true compiler guy. So of course we talk about uh, qubit mapping, we talk about um, uh, decomposition, we talk about qubit swapping. And then for the simulators, uh, I remember one, one lecture, I um, was just finishing up error correction, I talk about um, uh, Shaw code, I talk about the threshold theorem uh, and um, and so on. And then I said, well, uh, in two days, we're going to, to talk about simulators and I'm going to write a quantum simulator before the next lecture. And I actually did it. So it took me a day. I developed my own language. I wrote a simulator and some, some benchmark programs. And, uh, and now I had a good story. I could tell the student, you can do this too. You can write a, a quantum simulator in a day. And, uh, and of course, it was good preparation for, for giving a lecture about it. And then comes the homeworks. So, um, so one thing is to have a breadth of students and a breadth of, of topics, but I also want to have a breadth of homeworks. And on the next slide, I have my homeworks. Uh, just an outline, I have homeworks of all different kinds. I have homeworks about, uh, about giving proofs. I have homeworks about uh, uh, running on Craig Gidney's uh, Quirk simulator, which is a lovely simulator, I think. And then, uh, for example, for the preparation for the bernstein Vasarani lecture, I ask everybody to implement the pr a solution to the problem on a classical computer so that they know what the problem is before we start going into the quantum solution at the lecture. And then finally, uh, once they're in groups below the lines there, we um, uh, start to implement all the algorithms from the class in CERC and in Qiskit and then run everything onto quantum computers. And um, of course, I also have a midterm and we have a course evaluation and all this, and I grade everything. Uh, so I have, um, I have quizzes after many of the lectures and, um, and I told them, uh, 
I'm going to give 45% uh, of you an A, the rest of you will get a B. That's another trick I learned in business school. Just give them a little bit to incentivize working hard. And it actually, it, it, it really worked. Um, and um, so uh, now there's this question of how do we get them to take ownership of the field? So it's very good with all these knowledge and skills, uh, but we also need them to really feel that this is, this is their thing. And uh, so this is something we're very good at in classical computing. For classical computing, we can give exercises where we, um, where we say, tinker a little bit here, try something over there, and then, and then something will happen. And so we need to do this for quantum as well. And this is where it becomes very important to have access to quantum computers. And so we were running on uh, a Google quantum computer. So thanks to uh, Alan Ho, who was our mentor at Google, and to Eric Osby, who uh, made everything happen. And, um, uh, what we did there was that we uh, we wrote our own server, which uh, allowed us to uh, for students to send jobs. The jobs would be sent to the quantum computers. Res results would come back, and it would happen in a way so this, the students had some control over what was going on, so they could pick their own qubits and stuff like that. And then we also ran on on the IBM uh, quantum computer, and there the whole experience is quite a bit more automatic, and the students don't have to get as close to the quantum computer. So two somewhat different experiences. Uh, we also had Elliot Caput from University, from uh, Colorado School of Mines um, participate. And so his students were also running via our server on, on Google's quantum computer. And, um, and so this was, this, was a, this was a wonderful experience. And the thing that I think put the touch on it was that I asked them to write a report about their experience. On the next slide, you can see the, the kind of things that I, I asked them to talk about. So first, so, so let's get into some things where, where there's some, some choice and options and things they can try. How did you implement the oracles? How did you parameterize your solution in the number of qubits? That's something we, we love in computer science. Write general code. And, and, what, and what did you do to test it? What were the results? How did you experience scalability in number of qubits? And then just try different things. Try with some error correction or without error correction. Do you see a difference? Do you see a difference between working in the two languages? Do you see a difference between working on the two quantum computers? Just compare, 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 and write a report about it. And um, I think that is, to me, the way to get them uh, to get them a feeling of ownership. We need to get them to hack quantum. And uh, just try out things, make small changes, see what happens, see what breaks. And uh, we need to get them be to go beyond simply admiring other people's algorithms. We need to get them to try out things themselves. So, uh, so in summary, what I did was that I set up a learning lab for my class. I went for breadth and I let them loose on two quantum computers. And I think that we can, as you can see on my closing slide, we can give them knowledge and skills and agency. And in particular, we can enable them to hack. And uh, it's certainly worked out for me in terms of, of the teaching evaluations. So this whole thing is a, is a part of a bigger picture at UCLA. I have a second class on, on quantum computing where we take everything to the next level. Um, it's kind of worked out well. Uh, for example, I remember one student who worked at the bracket group at Amazon uh, after graduating from my class. And uh, at UCLA, we are also starting a new master's degree in quantum science and engineering. It's housed in physics. And um, this is a, a degree program that's very heavy on labs. Uh, there, there are labs where people get close to the, to the uh, to the machine, so to speak, in quantum sensing, in quantum optics, and in quantum, uh, in quantum devices, and uh, really get to learn how to work at the interface between quantum hardware and quantum software, which I think is where a lot of the action is going to be this uh, this decade. And uh, so, just want to close by by a call to action for all you quantum educators out there. We need more programs that that will help the students learn to hack quantum programs where making a small difference, a small change to the program will make a difference to what's going on and allow them to try out things. And I think we can do this and I think we can do it at scale. Thank you.